This is a caterpillar fly that I found on a guy's channel who goes by Huey Graves. He's got a lot of awesome tutorials. I saw this and thought, I got to make one. So this is how I've changed up Huey Graves' The Caterpillar Fly. I'm using a size 4 Arbor Dean hook from Walmart, and I'm going to take some other foam also from Walmart. I'm stacking two slices of this two slices of this foam on top of one another, gluing them together. They're about the width of a pencil. And then I'm gonna wrap all my line from the front of the hook behind the eye all the way to the back of the shank. I cut a V shape into the foam just for the sake of making it easier to tie in. If you wanted to, you could tie it in right after the eye of the hook. To me, it's a waste of foam and the fish aren't so picky to where if the back of the fly is a little bit fatter than the front, but if you tie it in tight enough, it's hardly even noticeable. Then what you're going to do is tie in your saddle hackle. I'm using, I think, a chartreuse color, but you can use white, orange, green, brown, anything that will go with this kind of green color theme that you're going with. And then after that, I'm, trying, I'm tying in some green micro wire. After you've tied all those in, I put almost an obscene amount of super glue to make sure this fly is indestructible because I like to throw it in kind of risky areas. And then what I'm gonna do is get some dubbing. This is in peacock color from, I think it's called I, Harry, Hair E Ice Dub. And it's in the peacock color and you're gonna do that nice little noodle. You're gonna wrap it all the way from the back to the front. It's gonna conveniently cover up all the tie-ins that you made previously. And if you see what I'm doing there, I'm trying to make the width from the back the same as the width from the front so that it doesn't look off. It's never perfect, but it really doesn't matter. Most of the fish that I catch with this, it does, they're not looking for the width of the fly to be perfect. Uh, the next step that I usually do is to make sure that between these two foam pieces that they're not flapping in the wind because if you leave them open, they'll, they'll make like loud flapping noises and it's harder to cast. Then we're going to take our 3D eyes. It's important that you tie in the 3D eyes at this step instead of at the end because if you wait to tie in the 3D eyes after you've wrapped everything up, especially the hackle feather, then the glue from the eyes will stick to the hackle feather and then you won't be able to put resin on it very effectively. Trust me, I tied a bunch of these. It's way better if you do the eyes up front. So we're going to put those eyes in with a tiny bit of glue, and then we're going to finish it with some resin that we're going to then use a black light to cure. The reason I use the resin, one, it makes it look better, but two, really the reason is because it makes it way more durable. I throw this fly at docks, at trees, it bounces off rocks, and my whole reason for bulletproofing my flies is that I don't want to ever be afraid to throw it somewhere for the sake of losing it or hurting it past the point of being repaired. The first thing to fall off of flies is almost always the 3D eyes. So put some nice amount of uh, resin on there to make sure those eyes stay in as long as possible. The next step is to make segments into the foam with your wire. And I'm using it in a, a bodkin, but there's nothing stopping you from just cutting off some wire or some heavy thread and having that be loose just behind the fly as you tie the rest of it until it's time to wrap it. Once that's all tied in, I'll then get a marker. So I've seen some people online, they'll do, they're do it using a type of uh, marker pattern that mimics a bunch of different caterpillars that are probably just in the area near the fish. I'm just using red, but I've seen people do like an orange base with a red dot in the middle or a yellow base with a red dot in the middle. Either way, it kind of serves the same purpose. And does the fish really see the pattern that's above the water on the little segments? I don't know. It's whoever, it's whatever you want. You can do whatever you want. Go crazy. So then next step is going to be to wrap the saddle hackle within each segment. On the backmost wrap, the very first one, it's kind of hard to make sure that the fibers all come out perfectly not a huge deal, but if you're a real stickler, just double wrap it on that first segment, which is what I did after, you know, tying the fly 10 times. It's like, okay, I'm just going to double wrap that back segment so that it's as floofy as possible. Once you've gotten it all the way up, you're going to do a couple of extra wraps right behind the eye of the hook and then use your thread to, to wrap it around a few times and then you're going to tie it off as best you can. Again, look how not clean of a tie this is for me. Usually I'm a lot more precise like there's a bunch of glue and the eye hole and 
there's not like a perfect knot there. I actually, I think I actually ripped the thread off, but man, that fly looks great and turns out it catches fish. So here I'm on the Guadalupe River. This is below Ingram Dam. Technically, I think it's still in Ingram. I was staying in a place called Hunt because I've got a lot of friends there, but man, big old take from a nice bass and reel it in. I was shocked. I actually was skeptical because Yes. The way that I've always thought of bug flies, like shadow. grasshoppers and ants and uh, oh, oh, all those beautiful. flies like that are, I guess, terrestrials. That's what it's all about. I've right always now. thought that they need to have some sort of profile to them with like wide splaying Man. legs Thank because that's the only way that a well, fish would realistically want to hit them. But that isn't true at all. These bass and sunfish that I caught were crushing this fly. In fact, the whole day up to that point, I had been using swimming nymphs, minnows, clousers, and none of that stuff had really worked that well until I switched to this topwater fly. It was so hot outside. For 2023 summer, it was the hottest summer in Texas history, and I think that day it was like 103 degrees, and it was only like 11 a.m. at that point in the day, but still crushing it on the bank. So what I was aiming for with this specifically is I was trying to land my fly right where the shade below trees were. If you can see Ooh. along the bank of the river down there past where I'm holding everything, there's, and you can see where my line is right there. It's in that's the shade. And that's because it was so damn hot that I thought all the fish would be hanging out in the shade. And that is what turned out to be the thing that worked the most is I'd throw the fly out. I'd let it hit pretty hard. It's not a gentle landing. I'm using a five weight rod with floating line and I'd throw it out there, let it sit one, 1000, two, 1000. And all the sunfish would hit it on the first hit. Like it would land and then boom, they'd nail it for the bass that I caught though. I, I threw it out there, let it sit one, 1000, two, 1000. And I started doing tiny little strips, like barely noticeable strips. And then it hit it on like the third or fourth strip away from the bank. So I don't know if that's just how it worked that day or if it's bass versus sunfish. But what I found was that most of the sunfish hit it right away. They were literally probably looking up, waiting for things to fall versus the bass had to be kind of was probably waiting to be convinced that it was something to eat. Anyway, I love this fly. Huey, thanks so much for sharing such a cool idea. I hope you like this video and be sure to go and check out Huey Graves on YouTube, the guy who invented this fly, and let me know what you think of my video in the comments. I really appreciate it. I'd love any kind of feedback that you have. Have an excellent day.